Hello everyone and welcome to another Skype session. And today we're joined by Matt Nelson. And Matt and I were talking before we started recording and we think we last met about three years ago at a conference. And I've been pestering him for a little while to come on the show and he finally checked his email and so now he's here. So Matt, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me on, David. I've been looking forward to uh, making this work for a long time and uh, like you said, um, I've let you down over and over, not not getting back to you through email. So you you finally flew out to Dallas and tackled me on the street. And uh, no, I think you probably wanted to do that, but we uh, we made it work. So uh, thanks for your patience, and I'm really excited to talk to you. Flying out to Dallas was Plan B. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> but for people who don't know who you are or what you do, uh, would you please mind introducing yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I work with Bishop Barron at the Word on Fire Institute. Uh, I work here as a consultant and a fellow. So uh, my job is essentially to work in the area of apologetics. And I, I help Bishop Barron with some projects, but I also create content for a Word on Fire Institute, uh, which is part of the greater Word on Fire movement intended to form evangelists to uh, evangelize within the culture we find ourselves in. Um, and so um, I create courses, you know, write curriculum for courses, uh, film courses, write all kinds of written content for, for obviously our Word on Fire blog and, and other places and, and have other projects similar to that. Essentially, writing, teaching and speaking is, is what I do here. So, Wonderful. And the last time I met you, you were clean shaven. And <laughs> when we became friends on Skype, I'm not sure if you're friends on Skype, but whatever. When we connected on Skype, I saw that you'd grown a beard. And so I always drink tea as we're doing these. So uh, I chose Love this it. mug, which my niece sent me for the time that I was bearded. So it says, with great beard comes great responsibility. So I have seen cheers. pictures. Yeah, yeah cheers. I, I, uh, that's a great mug. I love that. And uh, indeed, with, uh, I think if I remember that right, it's with great beard comes great response or with a great beard comes great responsibility, which uh, I, I guess is true insofar as a beard does seem to convey some level of maturity that um, is really just a big deception in my life. But I, uh, it's really only the last couple months, I think, where I've been able to grow a beard. So I'm excited that I've finally reached that point in life. <laughs> well, wonderful. I keep threatening to do it again, but we'll see. Uh, so this is a C.S. Lewis podcast and a C.S. Lewis YouTube channel. So we're going to be talking about C.S. Lewis. So yeah. where did he figure in your formation? When did you encounter him and how much impact did that have in your formation? Well, it had a huge impact. Uh, like I said, I, I'm working right now uh, here at Wor the Word on Fire Institute primarily as an apologist. And it's interesting because the first book of apologetics that I ever read seriously was Mere Christianity. Uh, my mother, my now mother-in-law, who at the time was just the mother of my uh, of the woman I was dating, um, is one of those. She's one of those Catholic moms that has like this like office just stocked full of books and Lighthouse Catholic Media <laughs> CDs. If there is that still a thing, Lighthouse Catholic Media CDs, all that kind of stuff, all the free, all those like freebie type Catholic materials, and uh, she just started, you know. I, I was a revert to the faith at age 25, which is right around the time that I met her. Um, and so, like I said, my wife-to-be, uh, her mother, began to just feed me books and CDs, and uh, Mere Christianity was the first one. And I just, I got to admit, it was a hard read for me because obviously we've got an Englishman writing a book of Christian apologetics, and it's a very accessible he was actually Irish, but carry on. Ah, that's right. That's right. Ulster Protestant, <laughs> right? So, uh, right. Well, but I will still claim him. <laughs> he lived in well, England for long enough. He's one of us now. Fair. Okay, good, good. And please feel free to correct me at any point here um, because I'm not a C.S. Lewis scholar, but I'm a big C.S. Lewis fan. Um, but yeah, it started with mere Christianity, and I was especially taken aback by his moral argument there because I just never really heard that argument before. Um, and so as a revert, that really captured me. And then over, over the years, I've continued to dive deep into especially his book, his books of um, nonfiction. But I've also uh, delved quite deeply into his works of fiction as well and uh, biography and things like that. So, yes, he's a major influence in, in my life intellectually. And then I would say also like even beyond the intellectual uh, personally as well. 
And just one note, when I, I, I always smile when people use the word scholar. It's like, I personally think amateur is a much better name because it literally means a lover. That's so, right. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to be called an amateur and a pedant. <laughs> That'll work for me. <laughs> <laughs> well said. And you, you would be an Englishman, correct? That is correct. So is it, is it England or is it? Um... It is actually England. It, it's very confusing for people on this side of the ocean. But basically, the United Kingdom is a country of countries made up of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And the right. British Isles has two islands in it, the island of Ireland and Britain. Yeah. There's a whole load of Venn diagrams that you can put up to, to break it down. But yes, I'm English. It's so confusing that it would make me ask you a stupid question. Like, you're an Englishman from England, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, it's cool. Uh, <laughs> okay, so that's your background in C.S. Lewis. Now, the thing that prompted me to get you on the show is you wrote a blog post about reading C.S. Lewis, or more importantly, starting to read C.S. Lewis. Uh, what was that post about? Well, I'll tell you, that was still at a time when I was fairly freshly introduced to Lewis's writing. And I had, I have this habit that I have not, you know, ever done away with of beginning books and not finishing them. And so I had sampled many of Lewis's books by this time. Uh, but I really was was convinced that, you know, early on, like I said, 25 years old, I came back to the faith and I'm now 36. So 11 years ago. And um, this was in 2016, I believe, when I wrote this this post. And I just felt convinced that people needed more people needed to be reading C.S. Lewis, be they Catholic, Christian or or even just, you know, an honest seeking skeptic. Um, and so I just tried to put together something that in a way portrayed my journey of discovering Lewis and coming to work with his ideas in my own mind and then and then translate those ideas into practical evangelization afterwards. So it's just a it's a sort of a step by step route that you could take uh, if you wanted to start to delve into into what Lewis has to offer. And it makes suggestions from his books of apologetics, uh, obviously to his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, um, to some of his uh, fiction, like obviously the Chronicles are going to be in there. And um, again, it's not an authoritative guide, uh, guide to reading C.S. Lewis, but the point was just to give people um, some recommendations to, you know, Pick it up at step three. That's fine. Every every single step, in a way, tied into all the others. Um, and it's interesting too because I also mentioned Chesterton on that list. Um, and so it's it's not just strictly a like C.S. Lewis book recommendation list. It's also you know sort of it, it. What I was trying to do is take people also into some of C.S. Lewis's influence as well. You know, so that when they come back to Lewis. Um, they have a, a deeper understanding of maybe the context within which L Lewis was writing. Um, and um, and so, yeah, I, I hope it's helpful. Uh, I should probably go back and revise it a little bit because it's been a few years since I wrote it. Well, I think it's a really interesting question. And you remember back in the pre-COVID days when you could be a, a speaker and go to churches and give talks and stuff? Um, I vaguely recall doing that. Uh, <laughs> but whenever I'd give a talk about Lewis, Inevitably, during the Q&A, someone would ask this question. I've never read any Lewis before. Where should I start? And I think there are lots of different ways that you could try and approach this, as you said. Now, in your article, you first of all suggest read the Chronicles of Narnia. And this is one I th which I think is often overlooked. Mm -hmm. Or if you suggest it, people go, aren't those kids books? Why do, why do you think that's a good place to start? Well, I think that... I think that fiction is a good place to start because everybody has an like whether or not you see yourself in this way and use this word to describe yourself. I think everybody just inherently has an active imagination. And I think that especially when it comes to Lewis, there's there's much to be gleaned, whether you're an amateur or a scholar um, or, you know, uh, a 14 year old picking up. Your, you know, a chapter book um, that's not too challenging. There's so much to be gleaned from these short little stories within the Chronicles. I just think that a, a lot of times, maybe not all the time, but a lot of times, 
fiction is just the easiest route into ideas. It kind of puts flesh on the bones um, before you start to actually unpack what the bones really are. So it's interesting because you read some of the commentaries on C.S. Lewis's apologetics. So Richard Pertil, for example, has a, has a really good book. Um, I think it's called The Kate, or I have it right here. Is it C.S. Lewis's case for the Christian faith? Um, and Pertil was, I don't believe he's alive anymore. He might be, but he was a very good Catholic philosopher. I know uh, Dr. Peter Crape recommends his work a lot. Um, but it's interesting because as he's laying out the arguments, you know, that are contained in miracles or in mere Christianity uh, or abolition of man, he's also drawing from the fictional stories written by Lewis, where Lewis's ideas are captured in imaginative ways within the stories. So I just think there's maybe something a little less intimidating about fiction, and especially, you know, in Lewis's short little books that make up the Chronicles, I just think that that's a good place to start. But I would add the caveat that, that there may be cases for sure where that, you know, that might not be the best place to start. So it's, you know, in day-to-day -day evangelization, we always try to figure out where the person across from me, where are they at right now? And we try to, instead of follow, you know, you trying to discover a silver bullet or follow some rigid strategy to try to bring Christ to them, we always have to kind of tailor make every single encounter, every single attempt at evangelization according to the person across the way from us. So I think it's a good way to start, but it's not always the best way. Well, for someone that likes biographies, they might begin with Lewis's biography, Surprised by Joy. And earlier you spoke about starting books and not finishing them. The very first time I started reading Surprised by Joy, wasn't a fan, got really bored, gave up. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, it is actually a tougher read compared to some of his other books, I would say. But also, it's a book to come back to because mm -hmm. I think, you know, every time I return to it, I just gain more and more appreciation for it. And obviously, it's kind of the opposite. You know, you could read a biography in order to get an idea of the writer and then go read their their other works and you have a context to work within. But then sometimes it's kind of interesting to go and read, you know, their own account of um, their, pro, you know, progression through life, maybe their intellectual journey or whatever. Uh, but and then and then go and read their works in, and in the same way provides a context. But then again, sometimes it happens in the opposite way where instead of going to a biography or an autobiography first, um, by just reading their works, just going right to the source instead of reading, you know, in a, in a sense, commentaries, sometimes it's better to go back to the biography or the autobiography later. And um, maybe it's better instead of thinking of A and B of so, sort of a cyclical thing like Start wherever you want, but just make sure you come back to it eventually. Yeah, absolutely. I, I Surprised by Joy made so much more sense the more of Lewis I'd actually read, and it itself shed light on the works that I had read because I encountered some of the themes that he talks about there in Miracles, in the Chronicles of Narnia, in Mere Christianity. Uh, one of the other ones that you suggest is read his letters because the wonderful thing about an autobiography is I can project what I want. And yeah. not all of Lewis's friends were fans of Surprised by Joy. Uh, one of them even suggested it shouldn't be called Surprised by Joy, but Suppressed by Jack, because he left mm. gaping holes and about his more personal, uh, his personal life. So yeah. reading his letters, you actually get to see what the man was communicating with his friends. And that was the, the next one on your list. Well, it's the same with Tolkien, right? I mean... You if you love the Lord of the Rings, you have to go read his letters because it just reveals so much about um, so much about what was going on, you know, in his life and within his own mind and imagination as he was uh, writing the letters, uh, sorry, writing the, the trilogy. And um, it's the same thing with Lewis. And I think like among, you know, among all the letters accessible to us today, his letters to children are, are some of the best, I think, to, to read, to really get an idea uh, of this man's personality. And it, you got to keep in mind, like there was no email at this time. And, and so these were, you know, in a way, deeply personal revelations of, of the person of C.S. Lewis. And a lot of times you can tell a person's character by how they interact with children. And I just think it's, um, you know, he never, he, here's the one really interesting thing about his letters to children is he was never condescending. Mm -mm. 
he spoke, you know, he wrote to them as equals in a way, but, but, uh, but still in a way appropriate to write, you know, to, to a child. So, um, that, you know, if you're going to go to, if you're going to turn to C.S. Lewis's letters, I would definitely recommend turning to the letters to children. It's a great place to start. It is adorable. I bought the book and I read it in a day. I was driving back from LA yeah. and I made a few stops along the way pulled over, went, got a coffee, and I was working through it. And it's just a lovely book. There's a bit at the beginning where he talks about a bonding moment he had with a child in a restaurant when I think he, he said something like, oh, I hate prunes. And this little <laughs> voice at a neighboring table went, me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, the other thing too is that you gain a, an appreciation for the intelligence of young people. Uh, some of the questions they're asking him about you know, the Chronicles of Narnia, whatever book they happen to be reading at the time, uh, or whatever they happen to be reading uh, of Lewis's works. They're very, the, the children and the young people who are writing to Lewis um, are thinking very deeply about some of the ideas within his fiction. Um, and so, again, I think it just harkens back to the point that we were making earlier, um, that fiction really does uh, work as much on the intellect um, as the imagination. And of course, Lewis referred to the, the intellect as the organ of reason and the imagination as the organ of meaning. And so there's always this kind of integration of the two and, and both need to be formed. And fiction provides us this really great opportunity um, to form both at once. And I, and I will say this also as, a, as an extension of that, that this is one of Lewis's great gifts in his nonfiction in books like Mere Christianity, is his ability to appeal to the imagination when he's primarily writing more intellectually for a philosopher or a philosophical audience, or you know, when he's primarily writing for now the reason, his use of analogy, for example, is just so effective in capturing the imagination at the same time. Absolutely. Whenever anyone talks about morality, I immediately think of a fleet of ships. You have the internal workings, exactly. the formation, and then the destination of the fleet. It's like three parts of morality, done. <laughs> Whenever anybody talks about morality, or especially the argument for morality, I think of little bits of orange. <laughs> I gave you a bit of mine, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> the next one you suggest is his essays. And I'll admit, this is the part of Lewis's corpus where I am weakest. I know he wrote a lot of them. I have read some of them, and I've enjoyed them. Uh, but there is a wealth of, of topics that he writes about, both yeah. his literary critical stuff, as well as more social commentary, I guess you might call it, and uh, and some more explicitly religious essays. Yeah, I would venture to guess that Lewis's essays are probably the most underappreciated of, of all of his writings. Maybe his poetry, I'm not sure. But um, I know in my own life, I, I neglect his essays as like, more, I don't read them as often as I should. I do read them. Um, and I would recommend his, you know, so Walter Hooper is typically behind these collections. And um, so, so it's not necessarily by Lewis, but look for Christian reflections or God in the dock. Um, those, those collections are fantastic. And actually I think as of right now, my favorite essay by Lewis is also his essay called God in the dock. Um, which is very insightful, I think, for evangelists today. Um, but yes, uh, his essays are great, and I think that we all need to make maybe a bit more effort to read them. I have suggested to my co-host that maybe we take a season out and we'll just do a different essay each week. It might happen. If, <laughs> if anyone's watching this and that's what you really want us to do, contact us and I'll, I'll present it to the guys. Now, the next one you put in was a surprise to me. Because your fifth suggestion was pray the Psalms with Lewis. Uh -huh. What was that about? Yeah, well, he's got his little book uh, where he's you know writing writing commentary on on the Psalms and and I wanted again I wanted to invite people into all of Lewis's writings and I wanted to expose the the depth of his abilities as a writer. So much like G.K. Chesterton, a great influence on him. Um, he was sort of a, in so far as being a writer, he was a jack of all trades. So he wrote poetry, he wrote essays, he was writing fiction and nonfiction, and, and even in this sense, a sort of popularized biblical commentary. Um, and I mean, a lot of these works double also as spiritual reading. Um, and so there's just so much there. And I think that, 
um, that's a that's a among, among like within his corpus among all of his works. I think that that little book on the Psalms is kind of a unique little little part of that. So um, that was my intention. There is really uh, it's not it's not a book that I've spent the most time with. That's that's for sure. But it is worth reading, and it and it is I think a, a unique contribution of his that I I think a lot of people don't even know it. It's out there, so um, that's why it's in there. Absolutely. Now I want to take your next two suggestions together because you say read G.K. Chesterton and read George MacDonald. And mm -hmm. I, I love this because my wife runs Pints with Chesterton, so she's the huge Chesterton fan, so she definitely approved of that suggestion. But why read those two? You've alluded to it a little bit with, with Chesterton before, but maybe fill that out a little bit and explain who George MacDonald was and why we should read him as well. Yeah, well, George MacDonald, first of all, if I start with him first, was... An, a major influence on both G.K. Chesterton and uh, C.S. Lewis. Um, and he was, MacDonald was primarily a fiction writer, a fantasy writer, um, who I, I believe, um, was, it, was it Lewis that said that his, imagina, his imagina, imagination was baptized by George MacDonald? I believe yeah. there's like a quote. Mm -hmm. It's in Surprised by Joy. Right, okay. And, and so that's why George MacDonald's important because he was he was the baptizer of C.S. Lewis's imagination in Lewis's own words. And so, um, as your listeners will will likely know, um, Lewis was a convert from atheism uh, to theism and then ultimately to Christianity. And whenever somebody moves as far along the spectrum as C.S. Lewis did. And when you go and you start reading biography of him, or, or especially like those collections of small biographies, I think James Como is one of them. Mm -hmm. if I got the first name right, but Como is yeah. the last name with Ignatius Press. It's a nice co collection of like people who knew Lewis, who wrote about their experience of, of relationship with him. Um, what you find out is that Lewis was like a hardened atheist at one point, and it at a certain point in his life, you would have thought, there's no way this guy's ever going to come to believe in God. So when you start to learn his story and you start to learn the journey and the complexity of the journey and the distance he traveled through his life from unbelief to belief, you should be very interested in the major players in bringing him around. And George MacDonald was one of them. And so I think, you know, we need to read him for that reason. Um, Here's the thing about Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis are certainly two of the greatest influences on me intellectually. And what I do when I get frustrated with trying to read G.K. Chesterton is I go to Lewis because <clears throat> in a way, Lewis is the distiller of Chesterton. A lot of what you find in C.S. Lewis's writings are in Chesterton as well. But and this is not to say that Lewis isn't an original thinker in himself. But you see a sort of, to use Newman's phrase, a development of doctrine in a way where Chesterton is providing ideas. He's elaborating on these ideas, but he's doing it in his winsome, you know, poetic way. And sometimes I think it's Dale Alquist that, that says you'll read something like orthodoxy and you finish the book and you think, what the heck did I just read? I didn't understand any of it. And then you look and you find out that like every second page is fully underlined. So. You don't know what you're reading, and yet it's changing your life. And sometimes you just need somebody like Lewis who kind of steps in for his friend and said, here's what he's trying to say. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I think Chesterton's important to read is because um, it, it makes Lewis that much more accessible when you kind of meet with Lewis, these same things you've already heard before but couldn't quite, couldn't quite distill it into a concrete thought. And that's what Lewis is really good at is just giving it to you straight. To use Lewisian terms, I would say he does transposition with Chesterton. He takes what Chesterton is doing and puts it into other language. I mean, he, refer, he referred to himself as uh, like a translator to communicate things in terms that people could understand. And I remember the first time I read Orthodoxy, definitely had that impression at the end. It's like, that was amazing. I don't know what I just read. <laughs> right. And then we did season one of this podcast and we went through mere Christianity. And then I went back to orthodoxy and so many more things I recognize, oh, Lewis talks about this in 
a single short sentence, whereas right. Chesterton is going around the housing, uh, he's going around the houses with uh, winsome puns everywhere. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I think there's definitely a symbiotic relationship between the two. If you read more Lewis, it'll help you understand Chesterton. If you read Chesterton, it'll help you understand Lewis. And, and one of the things that I really liked in your article, you compared these these two men, MacDonald and Chesterton, whereas Lewis said that MacDonald, he baptized his imagination, that Chesterton in some ways baptized his intellect mm. because he said that in Surprised by Joy, reading The Everlasting Man was the first time he'd ever seen the Christian worldview presented in a, in a clear and compelling manner. I forgot I wrote that, but that uh, it sounds it, good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it makes and it makes sense, and I and I do think that that kind of encapsulates what I what I was trying to say. <clears throat> a very it, there's a bit of transposition there. You just did it for me. Um, you know, I I just think that on their you know by themselves, McDonald and Lewis and Chesterton should all be read. But what you what you just said so eloquently is the symbiotic relationship that exists between them all. Um, should also be noted. And so by reading by reading all of them, when you go back to the next author, you're just gonna you're just gonna take so much so much more from them because of who you were reading prior. So so yes, read them all. <laughs> and one of the other things that you suggest in this article is to read some popular introductions, and you've mentioned one already, the one by Richard P Pertil. I don't know. Yes. Is that how you pronounce it? Pertil? Patel? Uh yeah, I mean well. Pertle, Pertle, Pertle. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, P-U-R-T-I-L-L. -L. And like I said, Peter Kraft uh, has recommended his his books, not just this book, Making the Case. Uh, what is it again? I keep forgetting the title. C.S. Lewis's Case for the Christian Faith. Uh, but he's got, you know, he's got other books as well to, to look up. But speaking of Kraft, he would be the other guy that I would really point people towards. You know, there there is a true C.S. Lewis scholar. Um, but but yet that's almost too clinical of a term for it because number one whether or not you or your listeners agree with this I think it's at least a debatable contention that Peter Kraft is like our generation's C.S. Lewis um, that's what some people claim and I think I think that's at least merited you know to to think about the thing about Kraft is he speaks in a way that makes you think no 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 he's not just an expert in C.S. Lewis's writings and C.S. Lewis's life. Peter Kraft is a friend of C.S. Lewis. Um, and in every one of his, and I'm a huge Kraft fan, another great influence uh, in, in my life. And it's, it, I think it's literally impossible to read one of the 500 books that Kraft has written and not, not read about C.S. Lewis in it somewhere. Yeah. Um, so th that's another person who I think by extension is going to teach you a lot about how to understand what you're what you're reading and how to deepen your understanding um, of what you find in C.S. Lewis's writings. Wonderful. Well, I'll put a link to the article in the show notes. As we wrap up, do you have any more advice to people who are diving into Lewis for the first time? I just think stick with it. You know, like I said, uh, when I first opened Mere Christianity, it was a little difficult. This guy was writing in a way that um, I wasn't familiar with. Um, it was still in English, but it was a different, we'll say, dialect of writing. Um, but it was also very smart and very deep. And, you know, I'd be, almost get so distracted by one really powerful uh, uh, proposition in the book that, you know, it, it was almost enough to close the page and just, just say, that's enough for me today. Um, but I just think that's – just persevere with Lewis's writings. And and honestly, if you just find that like whatever book you first open up is not jiving with you, well, you got a lot of other books and a lot of other genres within which Lewis wrote they, to choose from. So just, just stick with them. You, you won't regret it. Wonderful. Well, as we wrap up, where can people go to find out more about you and pick up uh, some works that you have produced yourself? Well, I would just point people to the Word on, uh, Word on Fire Institute. And so go to wordonfire.institute and uh, you'll find courses from theologians, philosophers, apologists, evangelists, um, all sorts of experts in different areas pertaining to evangeliza uh, evangelization in the culture we live in now. Um, and obviously a lot of Bishop Barron's resources as well. Um, so 
go to wordonfire.institute and uh, our blog as well, um, which you can find at wordonfire.org. This is where you'll find uh, a lot of my writings. And then also just look us up on social media. Wonderful stuff. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, when I want to get you back on again, I might just have to fly out to Texas and uh, drag <laughs> you to a microphone. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that for a second time. But <laughs> th thanks so much for uh, having me on. And this was this was a lot of fun. You're welcome. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>